Hi guys. Mark, how are we doing? Good. It is a, a pleasure to have you speak to us today. You're in you're in Washington State, right? I am, uh, just north of Seattle, if you know the area. Uh, so is it uh, is it snowing up there? Yeah, it's not very fun. The roads are terrible. Yeah, well, uh, I know that nobody wants it to snow here, so because they wouldn't want to miss any school. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks for speaking to us. Can you tell us a little bit about your, your background, please? Sure. I started out playing video games for a living back in the 90s. One of the few people that began doing that uh, in Boulder, Colorado. And I did that for a few years, and then I transitioned over to proprietary software training. So I traveled around the country and sometimes outside the country, training people in really boring and dry software and I did that for the better part of 20 years and then not too long ago less than five years ago I got into this and uh, looked at the theory and thought it was terrible tried to shoot it down and here we are five years later it's turned into a blossoming cottage industry that's certainly true so uh, how so they, they, the readings you gave me, I put on the syllabus. In my experience, most people usually do the readings, so they're already familiar with the basic arguments. But um, cool. could you could you kind of run down the the ideas for us? The Please. ideas here, I, I've got. I even got props for you guys. Okay. Um, not often I bring out the props. Usually I save those for conferences and stuff. So the basic idea is that you think you are living on this this little tiny rock that's flying through space in an impossible universe in multiple directions and varying speeds. And our community thinks we're living in this, just uh, basically an enclosed snow globey type system uh, with walls and a floor and a ceiling. And there is no space. What you see up, up in the sky are just lights, pretty, pretty lights, no different than you would see in a planetarium. Uh, if I know it kind of dates me. I don't know if you guys even have a planetarium out there. But that's what we think. And if you want the zoomed in view, you've probably seen this before, which is, you know, you're, you're living in basically a giant saltwater lake inside that place. And there's islands inside, which we know is our continents. And the whole thing is surrounded by the continent of Antarctica, which looks nothing like it does in the normal maps. That's the gist of it. And what... Uh... I'm having a little trouble because this is such an unusual idea. What, <laughs> what led you to this belief? Like, what what evidence is 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 there for this? Gotcha. What led me to it was the same thing that leads just about everybody to it, which was I tried to shoot it down. I hated flat Earth. In fact, there are mornings I still hate flat Earth when I have to get up at two two a.m. to do some international thing. Uh, the reason, what got me into it was reasonable doubt, meaning, and, and if you read the book or you read even part of the book or watched any of the videos, uh, can I prove to you the earth is flat right now? No, I cannot. Uh, not with a 100% accuracy. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place you have left to turn is some sort of flat earth model, some ethereal version of this, which is why there's so many different versions of this. Yeah, I can. I can do that all day long. And you're saying, you know, if, if you know anybody in the legal field, well, reasonable doubt isn't enough. It's like, oh, yeah, it is. In court, reasonable doubt can win any day of the week. And that's how we all got into it. it there are more holes in the globe model than there are in the flat earth model. Um, in fact, real, real quick for you, uh, just because easier is better. Uh, we've created a model or we've described a model that is now easier to explain than the globe. And what I mean by that is, even though these two objects seem to be about the same size, this cannot exist on its own. Uh, this needs a solar system around that and a galaxy around that and a universe around that. And it uses a huge amount of geometry and trigonometry and uh, calculus and quantum mechanics and all that stuff. Whereas this needs nothing. It barely even needs algebra. That's all it is. And you're thinking, well, you you just because it's easier doesn't mean it's right. It's like, no, not necessarily, but easier always resonates with the general public. To use a quote from The Art of War, uh, people are like water. They always take the path of least resistance. Why did we switch real, real quick from 
uh, talking on phones for decades and decades and decades to texting. I mean, has anyone in this classroom even made a phone call where you'd actually talk to a person in the last week? Maybe not. Why? Because it's emotionally easier to text, but that's a whole other thing. So, okay. You. So, uh, okay. So, um, again, you'll excuse my. No, I'm, no. You take I'm usually time. quicker on my feet, but this is, this is taking me a little bit of time to process. So when there's a satellite yeah. that goes up, doesn't the satellite capture the sphere and the rotation of a, a, a sphere? Or it's traveling above us in a circular pattern, no different than a mobile above a child's crib. And by the way, I'm not saying that there aren't satellites. I've probably said that in the book several times. Uh, you want to look up what the, the real thing behind satellites, look up the high altitude balloon program from NASA. They are the world's largest consumer of helium, always have been since the beginning they can launch payloads with balloons, either helium or hydrogen, uh, upwards of four tons, which is 8,000 pounds. If they can do that all day long, and they do hundreds of these every week. So why would you put anything on the top of a rocket? You wouldn't. What I'm saying is the satellites are very, very low by comparison. As far as geosynchronous orbit satellites, doubt it. Doubt it highly. So so the, the okay, so I, I, I'm just trying to work through this for myself. So. The satellites yep. are there, and you mentioned in, in the reading, I didn't get the book, but I got the reading. Yep. You mentioned it, but the uh, the satellites don't capture what we think it captures. Is that no, the no, no, no. The, the images, any images you see from high, decent altitudes are most likely from uh, spy planes. You know, military spy planes cap out at about 20 miles, and that's high enough to, to give any sort of satellite-type imagery. In fact, you could map just about everything with, uh, with high-altitude spy planes. When it, and when it comes to the bandwidth, can satellites generate some bandwidth? Sure. But anyone in the communications field will tell you, and I've talked to them, that 95% of the bandwidth, including what you've got on your cell phones and what we're talking through right now, is fiber optics and compensated with cell towers. Satellites are used for barely anything nowadays. Do, do you think that, that it's, um, and, and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson has uh, come out and How made... dare you bring up that name, sir. Okay. Uh, <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> well, do, do you, so do you, do you think it's that, that people are mistaken or do you think it's that people are actually deceptive? For wh which group are we talking about here? Just anybody in the people in science or people in Astro, NASA? Astrophys people with domain specific expertise like astrophysicists. Oh, no, they're, they're just mistaken. Um, there was a great quote by Nikola Tesla, who, you know, one of the most underrated scientists in history where he said that science has a notorious habit of just building on top of each other in tears without actually uh, examining the core foundation. And so he goes, when you get to a certain tier, because nobody's double checking the work below it, the, the work becomes meaningless. So it's not that astrophysicists aren't smart guys. Uh, you know, I've, I've been asked this many times. Are you, are you more intelligent than Stephen Hawking or Albert Einstein? He's like, no, no, I don't have to be. Because if the foundation that they based on their work on was wrong, then their work is wrong. Uh, you know, not, not, not knocking anyone that's into physics and astrophysics or the physical sciences, but they're, if the foundation, the premise that all the, the elevated computations are based on is mistaken, well, it's, they're just, they're, they're wrong, but not because of an intelligence issue. How's that? Okay. How, how could we, so in this class, uh, I don't know if I sent you the syllabus or not, but one of the things we do is science and pseudoscience and we look at claims and we try to apply the scientific method to those claims and I try to do the best that I can to teach people, you know, this is a scientific test, this is what it means and the scientific method, etc. Sure. What um, scientific tests could we perform to show that the earth was flat? Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll give you the example, and I don't know if it was in the reading or not. Uh, the um, There was a British, I'm sorry, German television team that asked me that very question for uh, astrophysicist out of Georgetown University. 
and they said come up with five scientific things that we could do that we could throw at this guy and then we will take your recording and we'll go back and forth and we'll just shuffle tapes back and forth because you guys are never going to talk to each other because no offense a lot of most scientists by the time you get up to your master's and your phd are pretty dry pretty pretty monosyllable type guys most of them not not every, every in this room i'm sure perfectly great <laughs> but uh, other people not so much um, so the five things we threw at him was, well, me that I threw him was this, uh, first thing was long distance photography. That is by far and away the, the easiest thing to test. Uh, and it's the, I didn't even come up with it. Uh, somebody in the community came up with it. People just started running down to the beach with high definition cameras, most not notably the, um, uh, the Nikon P900 and now the P1000, I think the 950 is coming out soon with massive zoom. And so the, here's the, the question is, if you're looking off into the distance, don't forget about left to right. If you're looking forward to back, you're looking off into the distance, eventually the curvature of the earth is going to hide objects. And the curvature formula in mainstream science says it's eight inches per mile squared, which means it's every mile per mile. Um, so it's, so like three miles would be three times three, which is nine times eight is 72. 10 miles would be 10 times 10 is 100 times eight is 800 inches. And it gets worse and worse and worse because it's supposedly gonna go vertical. So eventually whatever object you're looking out, out off into the distance, and you gotta use water because it's the only thing that remains level. I mean, you could use the salt flats if you really wanted, you might run into some heat issues, but it doesn't really matter. Water's easy to get to. That boat, that lighthouse, that island should be gone. It should be on the other side of the hill. It should be behind the curve. It should never, ever come back. And yet, and 10 years ago, I would have been right there with you. But now when you crank up the zoom on those cameras, now those objects come back into frame and they come back perfectly. In fact, the only question is, is atmospheric conditions, you know, because you're lo we're looking through kind of a soup. And that was the first thing that everybody jumped on, which in fact, I was in the models that I liked, I liked the Orlando Ferguson model, which was kind of shaped like a roulette table. But people says, Oh, you can't just use a roulette table. I go, why not? Because they said all the numbers in a roulette table add up, 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 up to uh, 666. They're absolutely right. It's like, ah, oh, crap. Well, I'm not going to use that. So they said, no, it's tabletop flat and they could never, ever find the curvature. So okay. that was my, sorry, go let's, ahead. Let, if, sorry, Chuck, let's linger on that for a second. So. Yeah. I have been taught, and I've experienced this myself, that if you're on a beach, mm -hmm. and it's a, it's a, let's assume that their atmospheric conditions are, you know, it's a nice day, in other words, it's a nice day, sure. and and you look out into the water, yep. the last thing you see as a big ship sails away from you, yep. a, away from the coast is the tip of the mass. Yep. In other words, the top. if the world was flat, the whole thing would just disappear. But because the earth is curved, the last thing you see is the top, sorry, I should be here, is the very top of the mass. Right. How do we explain that? Atmospheric lensing. Uh, I didn't even know that was a thing. Uh, we had to look that up. That And that's a mainstream science thing. It's not, that's not us. So what you're looking through when you're, what we're talking in right now, you know, what you're breathing is only about 99% transparent. You're breathing. Breathing. You're breathing in. Oh, eight, breathing. I thought you said breathing. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, oh. Breathing. Sorry. Excuse me about that. <laughs> no. what, what you're, what you're, what the air that you're sucking in your lungs right now is only about 99% transparent. In fact, it's barely even oxygen. It's, uh, let's say, four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen. So it has a thickness to it. And it's no different than water when, you know, when divers get down to a certain depth. You can't see the sun, you know, 12 o'clock high, new and above you because the sun cannot penetrate the water. The air that you're breathing in right now, uh, no different than that. It's just thinner. So when you go out to a certain distance, the air turns into a big lens. Uh, and so, and you don't need a mast ship to show this as well. You can also show this with tankers and cargo ships and stuff like that. And you'll see this weird blurring effect to where the boat, yeah, will be chewed up. But it's not that you're just seeing the top of the mast. It's the atmospheric lensing. Just, it's just fuzzing out the bottom of the boat. So, all right, cool. So, and it, by the way, it doesn't happen all yeah. the time. It, the atmospheric, you know, the it also depends on light and heat and humidity and all the other things. So, I know you're limited time. So, go ahead, go, go. No, no, no. I'm trying to be my. You're, so, you, you said I asked you a question. You gave one. Uh, I asked for clarification of a counterexample. Sure. And here, here's if, if it's okay with you, 
Could you give us the other four, and then I'd like to open it up to student questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the other, the, the other four things, the, uh, the second was gravity versus the vacuum of space. So is there a second floor to your building right now? Did you, is there a floor above you? Yes. Perfect. Okay, let's say you took the second floor of that building and you turned it into a vacuum chamber and you put a hole in the ceiling, you put a cork in it and you pop that cork. What's going to happen? It's going to equalize. The pressure is going to go from your room to that upper room. It's going to be instant. It's going to be violent. You're probably going to pass out. Some of you might even die. That's probably not something you want to think about right now. But if you want to see the, a great example of that, look up on YouTube. Uh, the Germans love doing this. I don't know why. Um, vacuum versus steel rail car. Not yeah. aluminum rail car, steel rail car. They apply a vacuum field to a steel uh, you know, rail car on the tracks, and it crushes instantly. It's in a fraction of a second. All those movies you see about space where it's like you get a hold in the spaceship. It's like, oh, we only got two minutes of air left. Somebody get the duct tape. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it is <laughs> instant. That is any th Anytime anyone does that in the movies, it is strictly for the plot. It's for the drama. So the question is, is like, okay, Mark, what are you talking about? So my question is, if the air upstairs in you equalized instantly, then why doesn't the vacuum of space suck the atmosphere off this world right now instantly? And you're just saying, well, because of gravity. I go, oh, no, 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 no. Why didn't the gravity in your room right here keep the gravity in your room instead of rushing upstairs? Remember, that's just a small vacuum chamber. The vacuum chamber of space supposedly is much, much bigger. Why doesn't that happen? No one can ever explain it. In fact, find me a scientist that tells me exactly where the bleeding edge of space is. Where does our atmosphere end and space begin? Third one. Uh, moon eclipse shadow. Which is this? Uh, you guys were, in fact, uh, in fact, I, I went down to Oregon. Um, uh, was it Salem, Oregon, for the the big eclipse a couple of years ago? Yeah, I was there too. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I was I was there in a little park. It was wonderful. We well, we shot part of the documentary there. And uh, so the eclipse shadow, the the moon is supposedly two thousand miles wide, but the eclipse shadow, the blackout zone, is only seventy miles wide. That's like a ninety-seven percent decrease. Why does it get so small? Why is the blackout zone so very very tiny? On such a massive object and science will say well you know it's condensing the shadow down to this pinpoint it's like a magnifying lens only with reverse and i go okay fine um we don't see that in real life ever first off you walk by a building and the sun hits you your shadow never ever gets smaller it never shrinks down to the size of an action figure but even if that were true, even if you could convince me that it happens, why doesn't it happen reverse for the sun? So when the sun gets in front of the earth, or I'm sorry, the earth gets in front of the sun, why don't we see a blackout zone on the moon that's four times larger, say 250 miles wide? We should, the, earth, the moon should turn into a big eyeball sometimes. Never ever does. And it works way better for our model than anybody else because we say the moon and the sun are only about that wide. 50 to 70 miles, not a stretch for us at all. Fourth, moon temperature. I didn't even know this was a thing until like I was like into this like a year. Somebody called me up and they said, oh yeah, by the way, the moon's cold. And I go, yeah, we all know it's colder at night. What the hell are you talking about? And they say, no, no, it generates a cold light. I go, what do you mean? They go, well, if it's 80 degrees in the sun, it's 70 degrees in the shade. We all know that the, you know, an object will block some of the sun's rays. It's cooler in the shade. But in the moonlight, it's actually the opposite. So if it's 50 degrees in the moonlight, it's 60 degrees plus in the moon shade. It's actually warmer in the moon shade. That's impossible because as you know, the moon is reflecting the sun's rays. It's reflecting some of it. That's how the moon glows, right? It reflects some of the sun. In fact, you can test this with a point and click $20 thermometer to get down at the hardware store. It, I've tested it myself and we've done it with copper strips. In fact, not only does it get colder, but if you take a magnifying glass to uh, moonlight it even gets colder so like magnifying glass of sunlight you can burn paper and things like that but moonlight can actually gets colder it's the technology we have now it's called a cool laser universities in fact your university may even have it if you have a science department like that where you can change the frequency of laser light and actually make things slightly colder not you know mr freeze batman type stuff but still colder Last one, number five, is the, uh, the Van Allen radiation belt trap question, which I came up with uh, myself, which is, are the Van Allen radiation belts deadly? Yes or no? It's a simple question. 
If yes, because that's what they were announced to be super deadly in 1959, why or how did the Americans make multiple round trips during the late 60s and 70s, at least six, maybe even seven, with no shielding whatsoever? You know, the only things that can stop radiation are gold, lead, and a whole bunch of water. And the Americans went round trips with just aluminum and plastic as shielding and nobody died, nobody got radiation poisoning, nobody even got cancer. There's still five of these guys walking around today. You say, okay, well, maybe it's not deadly. I go, okay, go to the nasa.gov website and look up the video uh, Orion trial by fire, which says that they, they will not test manned capsules for any sort of Mars program until they can solve the radiation problem. What are you talking about? You solved the problem back in the 60s. You solved it perfectly. No one's ever had a problem with radiation ever. Not, not only inside the capsule, but the suit. Long story short, I threw those five questions out there. The Germans recorded it, sent it off to Georgetown. The guy folded like a card table instantly, and that was it. They went home angry, and the segment never ran. I've still got the interview on my channel, the audio part of it, but it didn't surprise me because most scientists are... <sighs> narrowed down to a specific field and that was kind of a shotgun pattern of questions and i knew he couldn't answer all of them but at the very least i think he should have addressed some and he didn't so yeah there you go. so let, let, so i i know everybody's itching for questions i i am also itching for questions so let, let's just again linger on that last one so yeah when an astronaut when they they build a rocket yeah. and the astronaut they get in the rocket and they, they, they go to the moon? Yep. Or do they just think they're going to the moon? No, no, it's worse. <laughs> to, to quote Mission Impossible, it's worse than you think. Uh, what I'm saying is is that NASA, 99% of the people in NASA don't know anything. They build the rockets, they polish the fuel systems, they, they do all sorts of fun stuff. They don't know. Uh, no, no, no astronaut's ever going to get the t on the top of a pile of liquid explosives. Ever, ever, ever. Uh, the, which is why I love the movie Capricorn 1 so much, because it showed how easy it would be to fake it. You just say the astronauts are in the capsule, you take them to an Air Force base, you keep them there for a few days, you put them in a ca another capsule, you drop them in the water or now in the desert, because they don't even land in the, the water anymore, and they can say whatever they want. Don't forget, and, and again, I'm not trying to say that people are evil, and that, but for God and country, we're talking about soldiers here. All astronauts are Air Force officers. In fact, not even low ranking. Most of them are colonels or higher. One of them, I think, was a lieutenant general. So, you know, if you're asked, you, you've, you've already signed the waivers. Like, look, we, we say things we shouldn't for God and country all the time. So no, no ast no astronauts ever been anywhere ever. Okay, okay. So just just so that we can drill down, so I'm clear on this. So I want to make sure I sure. understand. So they get in a rocket. Yep. And somebody moves the rocket to make them think that they're. No, 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 no. They they're they're put in a truck and they're told they're put in a rocket, but they, they I doubt they ever get to the top of the rocket at all. They, um, the, the, the rocket goes up, splashes down in the ocean somewhere. The astronauts sit comfortably in an Air Force base. Okay, so the, the rocket does go up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the rockets, rocks absolutely are real. NASA builds rockets, and the rockets do go up. Sure, no question. Okay, so, so, okay, so I'm just trying to understand. So there's a rocket. Yeah. And let, let's say, you know, like Buzz Aldrin or someone, did, does he get in the rocket? Nah. Why? No points. I mean, if I suppose you could if you really wanted to push the theater option, but you don't have to have him climb up to the top of that thing going to rocket. Okay. You could just show footage of him going into a capsule. Sure. So, so in other words, they're in on it. Yeah. Oh God. Yes. Yeah. But, but not in the sense that I don't think anybody other than Apollo were told exactly why. The, ast the Apollo astronauts, I think, were told. I, if, you, if you watch the movie The Right Stuff from the 80s, I think that really was a great hero program. You know, it was the best of the best, and I think these guys were supposed to do what they were supposed to do. And then they told them at the last minute, oh, yeah, you're not going to be doing this, and here's why. Um, but, but remember, you signed... What was the here's why? Oh, you mean, you mean back for the Apollo astronauts? Like when you said, and here's why. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the reason why, why the Apollo astronauts turned into basket cases afterwards, I mean, most of them started drinking immediately and they all became recluses. They told them, they told them this. They said, look, the, or, or at the very least, they said, look, 
you can't go into space. There's some sort of barrier and we can't make it there, but we can't tell the public that because we don't want to freak them out. So, you know, you're going to have to do this. And really, I mean, again, they've signed the waivers. They have no, it, it, the astronaut saying something is different from you and me saying something. If the astronauts say something, it's straight up treason. No different than an Air Force pilot talking about who they bombed over in the Middle East, which they can't talk right, so about. Just, just so that I'm clear, I just want to really make sure I understand this. So nobody's going to the moon. Nope. 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 Astronaut, okay. the, the, the Apollo program... I mean, come on, the, the Apollo program had aged horribly even before we came on the scene. There were people for a number of years before the Internet was even up questioning the, the Apollo program because the production techniques were uh, inconsistent, to, to say the least. So I just um, I I, uh, I browse Reddit every day mm -hmm. and uh, I'm fascinated by those pictures of. You know, when they land those little rovers that MIT designed, and they have those big wheels, and they're doing that stuff. Yeah. And they have all these pictures of Mars and, you know, the, the red planet. I think it's super cool. Is that not Mars? No. No. No, the entire – everything that NASA shows from, uh, from Jupiter and Mars and Saturn is all CGI or different landscapes that they used in Earth and just tinted it through Photoshop or some sort of video editing program. It is absolutely theater. And and it started out simple enough back in 1958, but now it's gotten way too complex. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I know that my classes wants me to shut up, so I'm going to be quiet now. And all right. I'm going to open it up, but I do ask if you have a question uh, because the uh, recording is linked to here. So you need to come, you need to physically come up to the front of the class. So you raise your hand, I'll point to you, you come up, we'll make a line. First hand, first come, first serve. Come on up and please stand here or so where I was and project it at the, uh, at the uh, ball. Dun, dun, dun. Who's got a question? And, and by the way, I can see everybody just fine. I don't know if they have to come to the front. Oh, you got a guy anyway. Okay. The thing is that we have a, uh, the, uh, the microphone doesn't reach far enough. Yeah, the microphone doesn't reach to the back. Oh, really okay. Yeah. Hi there. Hi. Um, for being here. Um, I was wondering what you have to say about those people who actually take helium balloons and attach a GoPro, a GoPro camera to them and send this balloon to space and we can actually see the curvature. Oh, um, oh, sorry. Uh, fisheye lens most of the time uh, the GoPro the GoPro lens was notorious I mean the fact the entire go reason the GoPro lens was invented was to give you a wider field of view and for those of you who don't know exactly what a, a fisheye lens is uh, it's a peephole lens so when you look out the your hotel room if you're ever in a hotel does the hallway look curved yes it does is the hallway curved no it's not why because it's because of the lens well these videos are adjusted for this uh, lens distortion. Uh, fine, we've got the same thing on our side. We've got we've got for every balloon shot that shows curvature, we've got the same balloon shot. I've hit, in fact, I'll give you a better example. Every and this was the most blatant one was the uh, the Red Bull jump from some years ago with Felix Bumgardner, right? Everybody knows, and I have talked to people in the production world that said, "Oh my God, the curvature is ridiculous." Remember, he was only at 120, 130 thousand feet. That's what, 10 miles, give or take? Maybe, was it 20 miles? 20 miles. 20 miles. And Neil, Neil Tyson comes on camera, you know, on stage, and he says, there is no way anyone can see, no civilian is ever, ever going to see the curvature of the Earth. And yet the Red Bull jumps showed a severe curvature. Severe. Such, so severe that if it was actually real, the entire world would be the size of Arizona. And yet I can show you wonderful blue. I'll email you the footage. Uh, so many different ones of balloons at 120, 130,000 feet where it's absolutely flat. So who's right? The Red Bull guys or us? So would you trust, for example, a balloon that would have like a camera with no fisheye lens to it that you would have priorly uh, inspected? If you can, yeah, if you can find me a, a, a lens that's not fisheye. The problem is, is that lenses by default uh, always are going to have some sort of curvature. They're either going to have a, what's known as a barrel distortion or a pin cushion distortion. A uh, barrel would be sort of as some sort of minor curve and the pin cushion goes the other way. But yeah, absolutely. But I've got a better one for you, which is, you know, because people will say, you know, what in fact, might be one of your guys' questions, which is, is there anything you could 
show me that would absolutely make me abandon flat earth it's like yeah there's there's two things but i'll, I'll tell you about the, the the easy one and that is forget about the balloon put any sort of and i don't care i don't care if it's a gopro camera or not put any sort of camera on a rocket point it down towards the ground have that rocket leave orbit and show you know no editing and show me the earth start to ball up start to curve entirely and you know to where you're leaving it's never happened in the history of all space programs ever 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 why not in fact why didn't elon musk do that with that stupid car supposedly when it was heading to mars he just turned the camera off before it even left i mean if you would point the camera to 90 degrees like um to earth um what we call in uh vector calculus orthogonal yeah you would have to see the ball, uh, the, the, the Earth as a flat surface because by definition you're looking at it from an orthogonal point of view. So all three-dimensional shapes basically would disappear from that. So of course you will not be able to look at it from this kind of angle, but uh, if, if, if you slide the angle just a little bit, you would be able that's to fine. That, That's fine. I, again, I'm, I'm open to it. The point is show me footage, any sort of footage that's not edited. Any sort of rocket that is launched nowadays, they, they're really big into the jump cuts, and then they go to computer animation. It's like, look, find me, in fact, find me a decent shot. Why didn't, like, when the Apollo astronauts went on the moon, why didn't somebody just do a 360? You know, nobody from Mercury and Gemini and Apollo and the space shuttle, nobody did a 360 with the camera. Why not? It's, like, statistically impossible. Anyway, but, but I like the idea. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just a real quick, I'm jumping again. All right, come on up front. So, is Elon Musk is he is that is he bullshit too? The whole car up. Oh God, yeah. Well, if you listen to the thing that I that I wrote in the book, in fact, I was surprised how much I kept writing about Elon Musk. I hate that guy so much. Uh, he, oh, he's terrible. Well, no, in fact, I was sent that car. I was sent a still shot of that car in space, and I, I thought it was one of our guys that had photoshopped it. And I go, I go, oh, who made that? I go, did Jared make that? And they go, no, dude, that's a live feed. I'm going, what? I go, live feed? No, it was an impossible car. Uh, there's so many things that would have gone wrong. Remember, this was supposedly just his roadster from his garage that he put into a rocket. Uh, if you know anything about, well, what mainstream says about space, I mean, all the windows would have spiderwebbed instantly. All the pressurized systems would have burst. The tires would have blown apart. The fiberglass would have been torched because of it. Uh, that car was in pristine condition. And not only that, the, you know, the part that bugged me the most was that there were no endorsements on that car at all. Two companies, right? Tesla and SpaceX, one public, one private. There's no logos. That thing should have looked like NASCAR. That thing should have been wall to wall endorsements. As a matter of fact, Hell, uh, to, why why use the uh, the convertible? Why not use the flagship, the four door? You could have sold seats to Disney, put uh, Boba Fett, a stormtrooper, Groot, and Iron Man because they own all of them, and you could have, think would have paid for itself, and yet never ever happened. And and fact, right. find me a commercial, find me a commercial with that they use that. They never ever did. So no. All right, we got another student question here. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, I'm Zachary Evans. My question is pretty simple. Actually, as to relate to what you were just saying. Yeah. So when the Voyager 1 was finished with its initial mission, they actually turned around and took a picture of Earth yeah. from space because Carl Sagan actually convinced NASA that would do it. Yeah. So how do you explain that picture showing the curvature of Earth since you were just saying it doesn't exist? Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, the Voyager 1 footage was edited severely. And not only that, when, when did they find... If uh, you could put any picture you want, but if the video is edited, it's suspect. Plain and simple, meaning, you know, it's like, okay, this, this little blue, this little whitish dot, that's the earth. Like, really? Says who? The United States military. Okay, I guess. The military, can, remember, NASA is a military organization. Plain and simple. Yeah, fine, they, they wear white suits, they don't carry guns, they smile for the camera. But they are uniquely military, built on the backs of the still-burning embers of the Nazi war machine. So, no. No, NASA, unedited footage, that's what we need. Voyager 1 take, showing a still shot or a couple frames, pff, meaningless. So how would you be convinced that footage is released is authentic? The Voyager footage? How would you, any, any footage? Oh, no, you... no, what, what I just said. The only way you could do that is to have some sort of 4K or whatever they have cameras, 8K. Whatever the, the best camera is, throw it on a rocket, 
make sure you can see the ground and launch that thing. Do not hit pause. Do not hit stop. Do not have any cuts whatsoever and have it leave orbit. Plain and simple. That's all you need. It doesn't right. even have to. It doesn't even have to make it to another planet. It cannot be on a helium balloon, though, since you said earlier the GoPro footage doing. I that. mean, you could. Tr it's it's not going to be high enough. the The problem is we already have that footage. We have helium balloon footage that show, sorry weather balloon footage that shows it perfectly flat, and other people have it showing a curve. Well, who is right, us or them? In fact, most of the balloons that footage that we dig up isn't even us. We don't even send up balloons. So who's again, or, or again, I compare the Red Bull, either Red Bull's line or, you know, somebody else's line, but they can't both be true. In fact, the, the media guy that I talked to, when I asked him, I go, I go, you know, the Red Bull footage was absolutely GoPro to hell. You know, you knew it was bent so, so bad. I go, why'd you do it? They go, well, it's a better, it's a better shot. It's a more dramatic shot. It makes it look like he's high up in space. I go, but it's a lie. He goes, yeah, but it's, it's good television. I go, uh, all right, fine. I'll, I'll give you that. Okay, so just to be clear, to be convinced that there's real footage showing the curvature of the Earth, yeah. you need a camera facing down, going up with a rocket, live streaming with no pause. Yeah, and that's the well, it doesn't even, doesn't even have to be live streaming. Just make sure that I, if you want to try to recover it later, that's fine. Or, tran you know, or transmit it and have a delayed recording, that's fine, as long as it's unedited. That's that's the the giveaway. But here I got another one for you. Here's a here's a cheap one which I put out there. And does it prove that the Earth is flat or not? No, but it goes a long way into proving the space program. And that is my spacesuit test, which is give me any spacesuit from any era, from the '60s all the way until now. Get me in a vacuum chamber, uh, hopefully with somebody else that has a spacesuit, and turn that thing on. Tell me how I don't die, because the spacesuits defy the law of thermodynamics. Because pressure needs a container. So why don't the spacesuits turn into a parade float and burst? In fact, they're perfectly flexible, perfectly articulate. That's not my ex. Yeah. I'm just saying that that's a cheap way to do it. And in fact, find me footage. Here's one for you. Any of you guys scuba dive ever or know people that scuba dive? All right. Um, scuba divers, all they care about is one thing, the air gauge. They're constantly looking at their wrist. It's like, how much air do I have left? How much air do I have left? That's constantly what they're doing. Find me an audio recording of any astronaut ever that talks about how much air they have left. Ever. It's a miracle. It's, it's a modern day miracle. No one ever talks about it. The moon guys, that's all I would care about if I was walking around in space is how much I have air left. And when it gets under 10 minutes, I'm heading back. No one ever talks about it. So that's part of my spacesuit test as well. All right, thank you. Yep. Uh, so are you, come on up, please. All right, so you're here next. I'll get you uh, in the way back. I'll get you next, next. Thank you for being generous with your time. Oh, no, 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 no. This is what I do. Appreciate you answering student questions. I've actually done junior high schools, believe it or not. Oh, wow. <laughs> Can you tell, tell them your name, please? Hi, I'm Julia. Thank you for being here today. Hi. Uh, science aside, I'm wondering, what is the reason behind hiding this and or keeping this from the public? You did mention that they might freak out, but... Yeah, they they would have back back in the day back in 19 let's say 1959 when the antarctic treaty was built and the van allen radiation belts were announced um if you were the powers that be back in let's just let's round it up to 1960 would you tell the public probably not uh there'd be the, the upheaval and we're talking academic <laughs> academics for example all the physical sciences would have to be retooled from the ground up uh, economically, world markets would have to be suspended for months until you figured out what it meant. Uh, but the biggest thing would be the religious angle. Uh, you're talking about the main five religious houses of this world, um, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. You're all giving them license to come after science, to take the offensive against science. Between those three things, it's a very, very short meeting. So, but to your point, I think it's being allowed to come out now because I think the general public would be more receptive to it. I mean, come on, between the infrastructure is already in place. Uh, you've got high speed Internet, social media, six billion smartphones between those three things. Now you can push the narrative the way you want to. And the resistance would be pretty light. I don't think people would be running around the streets, burning things down, you know, with pitchforks and torches. 
So back then, yeah, keep it. I would have kept it a secret too. Absolutely. Um, now, now, no, no. As a matter of fact, I again, I don't. I'm not the one that's really pushing this. It's coming out on its own. I'm just kind of doing some of the legwork for it. We've received, you know, even though the science community, you know, National Geographic and Discover and Popular Science, you know, they've come out against us, but the the resistance has been token at best. You know, even Neil Tyson, when he when he went on television, you know, he didn't use any graphics, he didn't use any animations, uh, or didn't have any models. He just did a little monologue. He, he very very little resistance. In fact, if one last thing there. If Google, who owns YouTube, if they wanted to stunt us, if they wanted to shut us down, you know, the government has a huge hand in what Google does and what YouTube does and everything in our internet. They could have done it. They could have recommended us less. We were recommended nonstop on YouTube for three years, straight years. I mean, recommended for you just constantly in YouTube. I mean, the reason why, you know, we're, we're talking right now. Uh, and Google could have done that in its... Sorry, go ahead alternative reasons than just uh, the fright of the people because maybe this is a late a little bit jaded but I don't believe the government always has people's best interest at heart so I wonder <laughs> if there might be alternative reasons yeah that. yeah there is there is that um okay that that's a good question I usually don't delve into this but since you asked we'll, we'll do it uh, if you want an alternative reason why the government wanted to, wanted to let this thing out, you know, now, and that is if all of a sudden we are part of one big community, one big thing, then you have the chance of, uh, I don't even want to necessarily broach this topic, but, but we're, we're talking about potentially by default creating a one world government. If you wanted to, you could do it. I mean, seriously, people like get scared when they hear like new world order, you know, it's a scary topic. And yet, if all of a sudden this became the truth, uh, it would be default, uh, a new world and it would be reordered. So, uh, so, so yeah, it, it's potentially there. Yeah, no, no question. I'm, I'm a little surprised you brought that up. Very, very few people have, uh, and it's not jaded. It's being, um, uh, naturally suspicious. How's that? All right, thanks. I saw, uh, yeah. Uh, and by the way, just as he walked down here, can I buy one of those things? What, one of these? <laughs> yeah. Oh, sure, I mean, sure, sure. Amazon? Okay. I mean, these these aren't cheap. There's cheap models you can get. I'll send you a couple links. This one yeah, was made. I'd love to have that on my office desk at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll send you the link. I mean, this, again, this one's a, uh, this one's a silver. Uh, my name's okay. Jack. I'm Martin. Hey. Here. Uh, my question is, why do you draw the line at a flat Earth? Why don't you get smaller than that? If I, as a human being who was born and raised in the United States yeah. and have never left the U.S., um, how can you convince me that the other countries exist? Mm. Not it's just a government conspiracy. That's good. That's good. Um, th and, and actually, that goes into something I talked about in the last chapter, which was I don't even really like doing the flat Earth side of things because it's too... It's too generic and it's too simple. I'm a big uh, simulation guy. You know, I, I grew up playing video games. I was in the tech sector for years and years. So I know what we're trying to do out there. I know, you know, the, you know, the Matrix was, was a wonderful idea. And so the 13th floor and Vanilla Sky and, and all the other movies like that. But the, uh, what I, the Flat Earth, from, the reason why I bring up Flat Earth and don't go into like simulations or, or what you're talking about, it's like, you know, maybe there's nothing outside of your room, for example, is because the average person still doesn't get it. It's flat earth is the most, I try to appeal to the lowest common denominator, the general public. You guys aren't necessarily the general public, but the, the general public can barely get their heads around flat earth. You know, the, these are people that, that memorize quarterback ratings and who was the, the last person on Survivor and, and stuff like that. No offense to people that watch Survivor. Um, but where am I going with this? So the, the lowest com common denominator is is flat Earth. Everything else is is too complex. I mean, the Matrix is 20 years old now. 20, in fact, it's 21 years old now. And people still don't get it. They, Oh, yeah, you guys play the games and everything, but you don't fully understand because we haven't in created virtual reality, which I don't think we're ever going to get to. So that's that's why I stop with kind of flat Earth. I try to make it as generic as possible, cast the widest net, without without because otherwise it gets a little too weird. 
and people again you know the you want you want to attract the, the biggest audience you can so is it correct that you actually believe the universe is a simulation and that uh, the flat earth is just sort of the oh yeah yeah I, I talk about that in the book um it's there there are several things that really lean towards some sort of simulation uh, the first one is the double slit experiment of course uh the the single electron gun uh, version of it from uh, 15 years ago which basically says that that we don't render anything until it's there the, the old uh um thing uh, uh if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear, there to hear it does it make a sound well now we know the answer to that which is no because the tree's not there we haven't we haven't drawn the tree yet um that and uh little things like look up look up something you want to look up some weird stuff not only we're talking about simulation look up something called neuroscience and free will that's a weird experiment uh where the they can detect brain waves on making you're making decisions eight seconds before you even make the decision at all which goes into the whole predestination thing Ugh, i don't want to get into that too much but yeah yeah i'm a big simulation guy uh, no no question but i start with flat earth because let's 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 end this with this if it is flat and it is enclosed it's probably a simulation because every game you we play i know you guys play games at all whether it's fortnite or gta or whatever or minecraft right those are all built completely utterly flat the the world is just a big box but and you say well it's a curve they show a globe and it's like yeah 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 but they don't actually there's no globe in those games you can't tell the difference because you're so small and so but it's absolutely perfectly flat so that's where i start you know flat and then you know people get it i'll kind of explore past that if i could uh yeah. who's the number one uh, group that you're trying to benefit by promoting the flat earth theory i don't know if i have one uh right now because i well one i've only been doing it for five years uh and the demographics seem to be all over the place i know that we skew younger uh the u.gov survey which freaked out national geographic so bad said that um 18 to 24 year olds and this is a few years ago uh, we were skewing a full third skeptical of the globe, and then under 20, we're over half. So younger people, sure, sure, no, no question, because the cement hasn't hardened as much. I mean, if you're old enough to remember Apollo, the the moon missions, oh yeah, you're gonna have a really, really tough time with this. But younger people, uh, it's weird me saying younger people, uh, but younger people uh, tend to accept the world that is presented to them. And if it's, if it's coming across your phone, here's, here's the big difference. When information now that is coming across your phone, you give the same weight to whether it's CNN or a YouTube video in some cases. In fact, you give more credibility to someone who has social media status than you would an anchor that's been doing journalism for 20 years. So it's this weird paradox. So that I, yeah, sorry, short, short, short version. I, I don't really have a demographic that I'm pushing at just whoever's willing to listen. But you think that the flat earth theory will benefit them? I do, I do, because, and, and I said this in the clues, that's how it kind of got, when I released the clues, I said, look, if we are part of this, you know, some we're all in the same boat, we're all part of the same family, then you're not alone, and you're being watched, you're being looked after by something, someone, I'm not saying exactly God, I'm not going to name God, but <laughs> if that's the case, do you still do the things, do we still do, we still do hate crimes, sex crimes? Do we still go to war uh, if if all of a sudden you realize there might be somebody looking over your shoulder? Do you still do any? In fact, uh, l let me end this part with once I got into this, once once I realized it's like, oh, yeah, this is absolutely likely. Then I realized I could never do anything malicious against anybody again. Gun to my head right now. It's like, oh, yeah, do something horrible to this guy. Nope, won't do it. So fantastic. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, do you have time for a few more questions? Sure. Is that okay? Sure, why not? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Hi, I'm Therese. Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'm trying a little bit to understand exactly um, what some of the boundaries are revolving around flat earth theories. Um, so what you have there in your model is sort of like a dome. Yeah. And it, uh, so I'm curious as to your own personal flat earth beliefs. Yeah. Do you believe that we, so first of all, we're in, we have a flat earth situation happening. Yeah. Why 
are we in a dome in your opinion or is that just a theory that you entertain no the the dome the, in your, it's a good question. I don't know if you saw the documentary. 70% of our members believe in some sort of dome structure and the other 30% believe in no dome. But they still believe in, in flat. It's just that it goes on forever and there's no dome. The problem with that is that if you don't have a dome, you can't do a pressurized system. Meaning the only reason we have atmospheric pressure is because of this right here. Uh, if you don't have this, you can't have atmospheric pressure. So when someone says, oh, there's no dome, it's like, okay, when well, you're running into the same problem that you would if, if there was a giant space model. Uh, so for me, this is about as accurate as it gets. The only difference is, is that this, well, no, is that the white part, the white outer edge of this would be much, much thicker. <laughs> But for mo for our model's sake, there's some things we can't, we have a hard time drawing because just for convenience sake. So the, the white, the Antarctic coastline, the Antarctic shelf would be much, much thicker. The other thing that you'll see in models is that the sun and the moon are very, very big. Uh, usually in just about every graph you see, they're about a thousand miles wide. But that's only because we have to draw them that big just so they're visible. Um, the models we have that, you know, we believe the you know, sun and moon are so tiny that you could barely even see them, which is why, again, you know, the, the sun doesn't actually set. It just goes off into the distance. But if, because people say, well, if it's that freaking huge thing, it would be, everything would be lit up constantly. It's like, no, no, it's, no, it's really, really small. It's like, why don't you draw it like that? Like, because you can't see it. So yeah, there's some issues there. Any other, anything else? So then are the sun and the moon on the inside of the dome or the outside of the dome? And what do you believe is outside of the dome then? Uh, get get into get into the big questions, aren't we? Uh, for me, I, and this isn't a cop out. I, I try to live one world at a time. So if ev everything we see is on the inside, now do it. But I'll answer it. I'll answer it because I've I've got a couple theories on that. And that is, this wouldn't be a one off. If you're gonna have one of these, you're probably gonna have a whole bunch of them in different stages of evolution. Uh, you know, depending on you know who you are. So are there other areas outside of here that are like our world? Sure, probably. The big question is, do anyone from those other civilizations get to travel here or are we locked in with whoever the older versions of our civilization? Um, I also, uh, also want to uh, stress that we're not the first people to rent this apartment. Not by a long shot. Our unbroken history only goes back 5,000 years give or take, and then you've got all sorts of remnants of civilizations that are out there. I'm sure you guys have known, you know, sunken cities off of Japan, sunken cities off of India, the Bosnian pyramids, Puma Punku, Bimini Road, and so on and so on. The question is, who was here before us, and are we just another classroom, kind of like you guys? Are we just another uh, classroom of researchers and students that when we our time is up we're you know have to move off you know, you know again it's kind of like seniors you don't have to go home but you gotta get the hell out of here um and then just lastly why don't we try to escape our own then oh i'm oh no we tried I, we absolutely we tried the united states government and the soviet union look it up is not secret information and of course this is a guy thing this is what guys do which is like, it's like, oh, hey, there's a wall out there. Get the cannons. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like, let's punch through. It's like cannons aren't working. And the uh, look up uh, high altitude uh, nuclear uh, explosions from 19, all our weapons, all our atomic weapon tests from 1958 to 1962 were aerial. And again, that's, if, if you use megatons on something and it's not working, you're not getting through it anytime soon. And then I think they tried more subtle things. Uh, look up harp. I think they tried to do it with high frequency, tried to get out of there. Now I think they're, you know, I think CERN has a different purpose, which is okay, what if we open a Stargate through it? I mean, maybe we can get out through that way. I mean, it's more subtle. I don't know if it's going to work, but it's a nice, it's a nice idea. But yeah, oh, are you kidding? Human beings, sorry, I don't want to drag this out too much. Human beings hate confinement. That is the one thing, one criticism I've got where people say, wow, you're making it really, really claustrophobic. Oh, well, it's a really nice studio apartment. It's not like I'm <laughs> wiping out the universe altogether. But we hate confinement, and which is why I use the, uh, the wildlife preserve as an example, which is you dig a thousand acre wildlife preserve, you put buffalo in it. They're going to be just so happy. They got a river, they got grass, they got trees. Couldn't be happier. You put half a dozen people in that same thousand acre wildlife preserve, what do you think they're going to do? All they're going to care about is like, what's that fence over there? 
Why, why, what's on the other side of the fence? Why are we on this side of the fence? Who built the fence? Have we angered the fence makers? Maybe we should sacrifice things to the fence makers. Get the buffalo. They would, <laughs> it would never end. And that's all we would care about. So anyway, there you go. Yeah. Uh, next thing I saw was you. Can you tell me, can you mark your first name, please? Hello, my name's Cody. Hello. Uh, so I was, if, I assume the whole the round earth is a is a it's a global conspiracy. Dun, dun, dun. Oh yeah, that's yeah, good know. by the way. Yeah. We, well, we all so government people can't agree on anything. We all they can agree on that. Yeah. Uh, so for this to be true, you know, during the space race and all this stuff, yeah. all these major powers, Russia and the United States, would have had to agree, hey, we're gonna do this conspiracy together to fool everyone. Yep. Why would all these governments think I mean that? No, it's good. No, it's a, that's, that's a good question. I'm glad you word. I'm, I'm glad you worded it like that because very few people. I don't think anyone's worded it quite like that. And so it's always nice because I haven't gotten a, a original question in, in months and months. And your guys is you've done really well. Um, to that question, um, mutually assured destruction. And so two parts. Two parts of that answer. One is yes. Other governments do know, but only at the highest, highest levels. In fact, you know, do you like, for example, do you have to tell Trump, the, you know, the, the real story? No, not necessarily. You don't have to because you want him acting naturally. Do you have to tell Neil deGrasse Tyson? No, you want him acting naturally. They figured out after what happened to the Apollo astronauts, it's kind of a big thing and it weighs on people's shoulders. But as far as the why, so... If there is a chance that there's a there's something I've learned about power, which is men, if there's any sort of doubt, there is no doubt. So if there's a risk that people could even a 10% chance that people are going to march through the streets with pitchforks and torches, and, you know, just burn, start burning stuff down, you're not going to do it. So what are you going to do? Let's say you're you're the whoever the higher mucky mucks in China or in Europe or some sort of royalty. I, I don't care. King of Finland. Who, who knows? Right. Are you really going to break that news? How are you going to do it? And does it benefit you in one way or, or another? If it doesn't benefit you, another thing I learned about power. If it doesn't benefit you, you don't do it. So holding on to it until you can figure out how it benefits you, you're better part. Again, I don't think they were going to keep this secret forever. I think they were just, it's kind of like, um, I hate to I use this example, but it's the only one I can think of. It's kind of like hiding cigarettes from your roommate or food or candy or whatever. You can move them around here and there, but eventually they're going to find them. That's what we're talking about here. This secret was never going to be held for forever. It was just a temporary thing until they could get the infrastructure in place. So yes, the governments we were going to hold on to it, but only until again, the, the young lady earlier, they've got ulterior motives. Once they figure out how they can use it to their advantage, they're going to use it. No question. Did you want to follow up? Nope, that's good. Thank right, you. Thank you. Yeah. One now, please. You with the laptop. Hi, uh, I'm Will. Hi. Uh, so I kind of wanted to just like jump off that last question. Sure. Um, I'm curious about like how the private sector yeah. factors into that. Um, it's like we were talking about Elon Musk earlier. Yeah. Uh, like Elon Musk has a lot, I would say, less to lose than like a government organization. Right. Uh, like if he is he in on it uh you seem to think that he is um uh, only only to elon's in on it and, and it's good that you asked that because the private sector was something that i had wrestled with for a while because in the beginning you had to militarize space and you kept the private sector out as long as, as possible and which is why nasa was created and the other space agencies they're all government military organizations and then you got virgin galactic and blue horizon and um uh, Elon and, and SpaceX that came along. But you remember that the pools that they had to draw from were all military. So when Elon and, and SpaceX, you know, grab, grab their engineers, you know, they're going to, the resumes they're going to look at first are military, you know, based, based resumes. But does Elon have to know entirely? No, no, he doesn't. I mean, he has to know something, you know, again, it's it, compartmentalization is a powerful thing. It's kind of like, uh, what's, what's the example? Spies. Which is when, when you have a send a spy out, you know, officially there are no spies, right? But we all know there are, but we but there aren't. So when you send a spy out to, to shoot somebody, to assassinate somebody, you don't tell that spy all the political intrigue that's behind it. It's like, no, he's going to be there at this time. Here's your gun. Shoot him. They don't get to ask questions. They're not paid. It's above their pay grade to even ask the reason why. 
So Elon, who was basically built by the government, I mean, Elon, oh my God, a lot of people, you guys in the room, a lot of people in the room may not even know that he didn't even uh, um, create Tesla motors. You know, he just bought them. You know, that was, that's the big difference. It's like, who created Tesla motors? Elon Musk. No, 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 no. It, you know, like Ray Kroc didn't invent McDonald's and Mark Cuban didn't invent the Dallas Mavericks. You know, same, same thing with, uh, with Elon Musk. So you don't have to tell him anything. He, he, I mean, good Lord, he made his money through PayPal and then invested in, in different things. And people talked about him like he's this huge tech guru. Look him up. You know, look up a wonderful article written by the New York Post called Elon Musk is a total fraud, which means he's never, ever delivered on anything he's ever, ever said he was going to do. Oh, I'm going to rescue those kids with my submarine. I'm going to do portable solar power for Puerto Rico. I'm going to make a super jet. I'm going to make a underground rail car from Los Angeles to San Francisco and so on. And so he remember, he was supposed to send two people around the moon uh, two years ago. Never did. He's never ever delivered. But every, when you have a billion dollars, you can you can deliver headlines and people are like, oh my god, you can't believe what he just said. Uh, most people don't even know he's not even American for God's sakes. So anyway, what else you got? Um, yeah. Uh, so as more as more companies get into, so we're seeing more like Boeing is starting to um, sure. Uh, like SpaceX, as more companies like get in, as more private companies get into space exploration, yep. like is there a threshold for like the number of companies that are doing space exploration before you would go like, it's weird that nobody's... Oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. This this thing, again, which is why I think this being, it's the, the rollout's being allowed, the reason why I'm talking to you and talking to all these different uh, uh, educational systems and why we were on the cover of Newsweek and Popular Science and Skeptic and all this is because we're we're at that stage. You're not going to, you're absolutely right. You can't let every private company get into it because eventually somebody's going to figure out something. You know, it, it's gotten, it's, again, it started out simple. NASA was a simple organization back in 1958. Simple, right? Easy, easy to control. You know, there wasn't an internet. It was barely even television. So now we've gotten the social media and uh, the how we share information is getting really, really tricky, which is, again, why it, it, it's not going to be able to go much further than this without some sort of r big revelation. Okay, a couple, couple more, and then he's been very generous at this time. Did you, you didn't go here, did you? Okay, come on up. And tell Mark your first name, please. Hi, I'm Ben. Ben, got it. So, ben. my question, I'm sure you've heard this a lot, is if the Earth is flat and it's in this dome shape, wouldn't there be an edge at some point you could get to? Yes, absolutely. No, no it's a good one. Um, so, the edge would be, and a lot of people, it's the common misconception, which is why does the water fall off or why haven't people run into the edge and so on and so on. Uh, the Antarctic coastline is not the edge of the world. The Antarctic coastline is just the beginning of the edge of the world. The edge would be thousands of miles inland. Uh, look up some wonderful stuff. Uh, again, not secret. Inf none of the information I, I have is secret. Um, the, the American military did sorties and flew. The, his, his name was a Admiral Richard Byrd. And he literally spent 30 years from uh, 1928 all the way to his death in 1957 with the United States Navy, just flying and flying and flying down in Antarctica, looking for the edge. And then uh, he goes on television in 1954 and, uh, and says that, oh yeah, there's, there's nothing out there. We're just going to start carving this thing up. And then Operation 55, 56, Operation Deep Freeze was when everything changed. Uh, in my opinion, the, yeah, they found the outer marker, the outer barrier and then sealed the sucker off. And that's when the 1959 Antarctic Treaty was put into place. And which again is just a huge flag for me, which is no corporation from any country ever can set up shop in Antarctica for any reason till the end of time. It's the only unbroken treaty in the history of treaties. And you guys have been through the education system. There's a lot of treaties. In fact, in America, we're notorious for breaking treaties. And this one, you're not even allowed, not only are you not allowed to break it, you're not even allowed to talk about it. So short version to your thing, uh, where is the edge? Thousands of miles inland from the Antarctic coastline. And oh, sorry, follow up question because you're going to ask it. I know you're going to, which is, well, what, what does it look like? It's like, I don't know, man. It's, it's like, is it, is it a, is it a, um, is it a solid barrier? Is it a heavy element? Is it heavy water? Is it high frequency? Is it a force field? Is it a unified field? 
I don't know, whatever it is can withstand. I think the biggest shot we took was three megatons. That's enough to wipe out a small country and didn't work. So there you go. I saw a few and uh, oh, I see. Uh, please, please tell Mark your first name. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Ward. Hi. Uh, uh, instead of asking more about like the math and science part, I was actually wondering more about your opinion on, say, if like everybody just started like, okay, flat Earth, real, just like flat out everything. How would it benefit, I guess, like the human society, like to immediately switch over from spherical idea to this is flat Earth? If it, yeah, no, it's a good question. If, if that is the case, if, you know, cause I believe in the, the look up something else called the hundredth monkey effect, which, you know, I didn't invent it. Science came up with it, which is just fascinating, which is, it says that if enough of a particular species learns something new, then the rest of the species gets updated like software immediately worldwide, you know, for that particular species. So if human beings, if we hit that tipping point where it's, for lack of a better term, it's cooler to believe and more acceptable to believe in flat earth than not believe in flat earth, then all of a sudden I think there's a shift in how we think, which is again, what, you know, do you still do? Because again, not to get into the spiritual side, I know separation of church and state, but if this is it, then it was built. And it was built by somebody. And you really only have two choices. Either some sort of advanced civilization that's much older and much more powerful than us and been around for a very, very long time. Or the divine. And it's like, okay, you're kind of splitting hairs because one man's advanced civilization is another man's deity. So at that point, if it, that is the case, if, if it was built, I think we all act differently. Uh, there's an old saying, and that is, uh, when all the class, all the students, um, arrive in their seats, the, the teacher shows up. So that's what I believe happens. I think there's, I think there's an automated part to this system to where if the human consciousness, you know, if all of a sudden we, uh, more people figure if that tipping point, that threshold, more people figure it out than not. Uh, I think the system will react now how I don't know, but that's just an instinct. So you don't believe there's just like a, oh, if everybody accepts this, there is only this, uh, I guess like, oh, there's this blatant benefit from it, not just the, oh, it opens up everyone's people or opens up their minds of, oh, thinking, I guess, differently. But like, it's kind of like if the tables were flipped, like if almost everybody believed flat earth and there was this few people who believed in like the sphere of it. Right. Earth, like, is is there any benefit if it was the other way around because then the people who believe in the spheroid would be more marginalized group well, and then, it, it, again the, the, that's that's good but you got to remember that everybody that got into this everybody in our community that got into this so far nobody nobody thought flat earth was great everybody thought flat earth was terrible it was it was a piece of trash everybody what they did was they tore this down themselves so you can't go after the same thing when, when I talk to people. It's like, look, I don't go after people because they believe in the globe. In fact, I don't even get mad. People come at me and during radio and TV things and just yell and scream and get all angry. And I'll go, look, and, and then people say, why, why aren't you firing back at them? Why aren't you, you know, getting, getting angry? And I go, how can I? I used to be them. I, I said, in fact, I took me way longer than it took other people. Some people, the average incubation period, terrible word, uh, is about two weeks. And it took me about nine months. I was really stubborn, Taurus. So, <laughs> really stubborn. So, it, so it took me nine months. So, if other people, so we know, if, if if all of a sudden there were less, you know, people that believed in this, I can't get mad at them. It's like, oh yeah, we'll get them eventually. Now, if if you have like a master's degree in a physical science or higher, even a bachelor's degree in a physical science, it's going to be really, really, really tough. Uh, I have yet to find somebody with a master's degree, for example, in physical science that, that came around, except there's this uh, Asian guy at USC, uh, professor, but it doesn't really matter. Does that kind of answer your question, though? I mean, in a way, it's like I'm a psych major, so I was actually kind of going more off of like what you're thinking of, was it versus just argument to argument? Well, so. I mean, again, if, if it comes to that, I, I don't think it's ever going to get to the point where 
uh, it'll just be naturally, it'll will naturally shift because I think the powers that be will have to get involved. You remember, if, if it does end up being flat, you're talking about a whole nother too big to fail scenario because there'd be a massive class action lawsuit against every space program simultaneously. And that can't, that can't be allowed to happen. So, well, I was just thinking more of the hypothetical kind of situation. Like, not just, oh, it actually happens just like, say it was switched. Like, if, what would any benefit happen? You mean, if, if, how does it benefit you if it all of a sudden becomes flat? Well, in your opinion, how would it benefit either society? Oh, okay. People? No, no, no. The kind of what, kind of what I mentioned earlier, which is it potentially gives, uh, oof, people would be less inclined to act on impulse, negative impulses. Uh, okay, here, the, the example I gave in like the clues was this. So you've all been to stoplights that have had cameras on them, right? Right. So you, everyone, everyone's run a stoplight at least once in their life, but you don't run the ones that have a camera on them. Why not? It's like, well, because I'm afraid of getting caught and getting my picture taken. Well, why were you thinking about it then? And that's because your impulse. So think about a giant. Ugh, it sounds terrible now that I say it out loud. <laughs> Let's say there was a giant camera. You know, if there was someone kind of looking over you. You know, again, not not necessarily an overlord, but you know, a parent peek, peeping over the top of the newspaper. You know, making sure you're not burning anything down. Do you act differently? Yeah, yeah, you bet you do. You're not you're not going to do the same things you would because you're afraid of the repercussions. Can I can I try something real quick? I have a lot of hands could i try to like do this in machine gun fire sure. they'll ask the question and you keep your answer i'll keep to my answers to tw 20 seconds is that 20 seconds okay right. let's just do it and be respectful this time oh well good luck with the 20 seconds i got a couple questions <laughs> <laughs> um, I, uh i've been hiding behind the camera but my uh, my first question is uh, actually has to do with the um the sun and the moon 20 seconds for you too you got 20 seconds. Shush. Anyways, <laughs> um, Go. so I I know that you said that the moon also produces its own light. So yeah. uh, I'm I'm just going to assume that you also agree with the mechanism by which the sun produces its light, the nuclear fusion. Right. Uh, how 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 do you posit that the moon produces its light? Again, what powers the moon? I don't know. Whatever's whatever's generating though is generating a cool laser. That's all I can. That's all I can tell you. With a completely different frequency from the sun, uh, I treat it no different. You want the the short version? The sun is an incandescent light bulb, and the moon is an LED nightlight. And what's powering them? I don't know. Uh, it's it, look up a look up an interesting guy named Eric Dollard, a physicist who says that he goes, yeah, he goes the sun and the moon, or especially the sun. He goes, he goes, there's no fusion in the sun. He goes, he goes, what you're seeing there is not what he goes. It seems like it's just a transformer. It's just, he goes, he goes, a lot of scientists know this. It's just getting its power from something else. So again, a light bulb. And uh, my, my other question also has to do with um, time zones. So if, if, uh, and I recently visited Germany, so I, I don't have any doubts that time zones are a thing. Oh, yeah. I don't know. So, but um, if every part of the uh, Earth experiences seeing the sun at a different time. Yep. We also experience the sun rising over the horizon and then falling back down under the horizon. Yep. Uh, how, how are those two things compatible with uh, flat Earth? Got it, got it, got it. Okay, the, the sun, and you can look, there's some wonderful videos out there, uh, even on my channel. We didn't even think it was a thing until a couple of years ago, which was the sun, even though it looks like a setting, is just going off into the distance and fading away through the atmospheric lensing. Meaning you could look at the sun as like it's halfway down underneath the water. You could crank up the zoom, the sun's pop back up. How does that work exactly? So if the sun is a really, really tiny object, again, of course there's time zones. We, we all know that. Uh, but if the sun just goes off a tiny object and it goes off into the distance, you're just seeing it fade away no different than you would an airplane. Which is a whole nother thing. Why is an airplane, if the curvature of the earth, why is an airplane look when it goes off in the distance? Why doesn't look like it's crashing into the ground instead of just keep going straight until it's like one pixel? All right. <laughs> and, and my my last question yeah. is: um, uh, some of the the uh, planets like uh, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars yep. we can see from Earth. Mm -hmm. 
you think that uh, with the naked eye as and they look indistinguishable from other stars. So do you think? Do you believe that they are um, in, in actuality indistinguishable? Like they're just the same type of thing as the other stars that we see? Uh, I mean, they're slightly. You're absolutely right. They're abs- they're slightly larger. They're a different color and they move differently. Uh, but are they just lights in the sky? Yeah. I mean, the planetarium, you can do a, go to a planetarium and they can do a really decent Jupiter. I had a guy ask me, he goes, he goes, look, I've seen the moons of Jupiter with my telescope. I go, great. I go, take a pair of binoculars, go to the planetarium. Do you see the moons of Jupiter? He goes, yes. And I go, what's your point? And he goes, and I said, <clears throat> um, if you walk out of that planetarium, who's to say you're just not in a much, much bigger one? All right, let's walk over here. Come on down. Oh, wow, we've got a lot of questions. Yeah. All right, uh, and then let's line people up. So let's try to be respectful this time, and I'm certainly not going to go over. <laughs> You're so fine. Who's going to be next? Hello. First name, please. I'm Jordan. Hi. So I'm not sure if I'm understanding correctly. Are you are you saying that the dome is a clear dome that you can see things through, or that the stars and everything are projected on a Oh, yeah, yeah, no, and you're absolutely right. Um, no, the, the clear part is just because, I don't know, it looks better here. Uh, but no, it would be, it wouldn't have to be clear. In fact, I'm a big believer that it's just a giant screen, uh, that the whole thing is a projection. Uh, you can, uh, everything is projected onto it. So no, no, so, not clear. So then wouldn't people in different countries see the stars at different angles ah, would you be able to try and get it out of the dome good I was, I was wondering when somebody would get to that uh yeah however you can do what no different than we use in any of our simulations so uh, multiple everything is instanced so if you know anything about software uh the sky can be instanced not only geographically but to the individual and so I would choose geographically. So, like, for example, you and your friend are in either different states or different countries, right? And you're both looking at the belt of Orion. And you say, oh, yeah, the belt of Orion looks, it's made up of all blue stars. And he says, no, it's made up of all red stars. Who's right? Well, technically, you both could be right because you're looking at two different projections. And, or, again, take it even one step further, that stupid dress. Are you guys old enough to remember the, the, the white dress, black dress thing from some years ago? Yes. Yeah. So same sort of thing. You guys are both staring at the same screen. One says white, one says black. Who's right? You could both take lie detectors. You'd both pass. Weird. What else? So, so you think, so are, are you... Are you suggesting that we are in an entirely simulated universe a la the Matrix, or we are in a physical universe that this this is all real, but we are having something projected onto our experience? E- either or both. Because remember, if you're the, the, the tough part about talking about simulations is it doesn't mean anything to the person that's inside it because we only know it. You know, we don't know what's outside it. We, we of course, can talk about simulations because we've made simulations and we're on the outside looking in. But when you're inside it, of course, it's absolutely real and physical to us and we couldn't distinguish it from anything else. Uh, you know, I'd like to, I, you know, being inside it with you guys right now, uh, of course, it's absolutely real. Everything feels real, smells real. We've got our senses. Uh, but is it po- quite possible that it is some sort of manufactured environment yeah, sure. Why not? I get to remember that even the simulations that we make are complete illusions, like Fortnite uh, or Minecraft. You're walking around a 3D world. There's no 3D world. It's a 2D world that's given the illusion of 3D. There's nothing 3D about it. Only It's only 3D to your visual spectrum. Sorry, what else? All right, last question. Yeah. Um, so do you believe that atmospheric pressure changes with height? Yes. And if I go up higher, the atmospheric pressure will be less? Yes. Do you believe that that stops at some point? You mean, does or, the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I think eventually you're going to hit some sort of... Uh, well, no, because I know eventually you're going to run into some sort of barrier. No different than atmospheric pressure, no different than water pressure, which is, you know... Why don't balloons hit the dome? Because they can't get up that high. The, the dome, we're talking about a structure that is probably several thousand miles up. At the very least, I mean, even our highest, if you even go by the military stuff when they were doing atomic weapons back in the 50s, their highest shot was 400 kilometers. Our balloons can't even come close to that. 
I mean, our balloons, our balloons right now capping out uh, the non-classified ones at 20 miles. That's nothing. So you think that the, the pressure gets low enough that balloons can't go high enough to hit the dome, but you don't believe that the pressure gets low enough that you, you think you still need a dome to keep the pressure in? Something to that effect, yes. Okay. Yeah. I do, do, I, do I know exactly how that works? Nope. All right, we got to tell, uh, tell Mark your name and got a couple more and then we're going to cap it. She's got a notebook. Oh boy. Um, no, so I just want to touch more on like the why that this is something that that you care about. You mentioned that for you, believing that the Earth is flat and that there's someone viewing it and kind of seeing everything, and that's what keeps you in some sort of like moral. Um, my moral, path. my moral compass. Yeah. Yeah, so you're, you were saying that even if someone held a gun to your head commanding you to hurt someone, you would never do that nope. because you believe the earth is flat and someone's watching you and that has some sort of consequence. Yep. Is that something shared amongst the flat earth community? Is, do other people believe that sentiment as well? <sighs> Not as strongly because I, I think a lot of the people in the community still, uh, you know, again, there's, there's levels of understanding here and I don't think a lot of them see the bigger picture. And so, yeah, for some of them, you know, they're, they're still, most of the community that I've run into, they're still hitting the basics, which is it's flat because of this, give, you know, give me your globe arguments, I'll give you my flat arguments. And they, they, but I'm a big picture guy. So I'm looking at the chessboard, the, the whole chessboard all the time. Okay. So with, I, I guess I'm just more curious as to why that's so important for you and that the, you've come to that conclusion of having that moral compass because the earth is flat, but that other people don't share that. Well, again, it's just, it's a personal view. I, I've got a lot of passion and conviction about, about things. So when it comes to there being potentially a higher power, and again, I'm not gonna go down whatever it is. If there's a higher power, despite, you know, then, then the, there is purpose. You know, you're, you know, if you're on this spinning ball flying through space, you mean nothing. Basically, you're part of the Big Bang and you could get snuffed out at any time and your existence is complete accident. Where is if you're in some sort of enclosed system that was absolutely built for a reason and it was built by someone for you. And if it was built by somebody for you, then I would think you'd want to be on your best behavior. And sure. so that's so, just something I live by. Yeah, no, I, I, so it sounds to me like having purpose and reason is one of the main reasons why you dedicate your time to this theory, because for you, finding the right reason to have a moral compass is important. Oh yeah, yeah, ab absolutely is. And, and by the way, real, real quick, I didn't want to do this. I, I've said this in the documentary, I said this in the book. There are mornings I absolutely hate Flat Earth because of what it's done. I mean, I didn't, it just came and grabbed me like an amusement park ride and just took me along. I didn't want to run point on this i wanted other people to do it and it just people just keep calling me and asking me to do things and it's like okay sure why not i mean apparently it's it's what i was meant to do i don't know why i mean i was perfectly happy living a very quiet boring life in colorado and i mean i did seven conferences last year in i did them in denver calgary auckland stockholm london I did street activism in Belfast and Dublin. Uh, street, street activism? I did street activism. Yeah. And I don't, I'm not even into street activism. And they, they said, oh yeah, fly over. We'll, we'll take you in a van. It's part of the Globe Lie Euro tour, which they just finished up. Wild. Absolutely wild. Yeah, it so. wasn't a global tour then. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Sorry, it's good. Sorry. No, no, sorry. I've heard it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. How I condensed it down into one thing was hearing that for you, like it, it keeps you from doing bad things against other people. The, the earth being flat and having this observer for you keeps you on a moral path. And I do you feel that if other people believed it the way that you did, to where you've aligned your moral stuff with the, the way that you feel the reality of the earth being flat? Um, it kind of all condensed down to uh, if, if the earth is flat, then there could potentially be world peace if everybody got onto the same idea as you did. Whereas, like, if is that like what I'm, if you were you're, to you're, say, you're, everyone you're, believe that you Yeah, 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 yeah. You're absolutely right. Uh, first off, I kill way less people than I used to. 
uh, because <laughs> I, uh, the, as far as the other as as far as other people is are, are concerned though yeah you're absolutely right w world peace would be a wonderful you know w peace in our time you know i I'd, I'd love for that to happen sure no question uh but i but for most people out there it's a message of hope which is the potential of people to be better for the potential for people to be like look our civilization we have so much so much potential and so much we can do and we seem to have squandered it over the last 500 years at the very least and i think that this has the potential of turning that around now if other people don't agree with me fine but just what i what i live by now that's one um you'd be willing to say that if other people derived like a moral compass in a different way but got to the same conclusion of like not harming others for whatever external reason that is that would be a great goal and they wouldn't have to believe oh yeah it. yeah i i, I it, it's a lofty goal but i i think it's really possible because of what i've seen in the community the people that i've seen come in at the conferences and the meetups and everything else i've seen uh it changes people it it makes it, it gives them i, I it paints them in a softer light they see things in much a much more gentle way. Hi, Melissa. Hi. Um, Wait, actually, didn't I talk to you already? No, oh, okay. I'm brand new. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, first thing before we actually ask most of the questions I wanted to ask, it's going to be really quick. Okay. So if we had proof positive that the Earth is flat. Would that be also proof of a higher power, in your opinion? Or oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then it's just a question of, <laughs> it starts up a whole new line of, of discussions, which is, if it is a higher power, who, you know, who does it lean towards? It's like, ah, because uh, literally, again, those the five major religious houses, they've all reached out to me in one way or another, and they all have a stake in this. And they all identify with it, which is really, really interesting. It's almost like, uh, you know, it, it, it has the potential of turning into its own universal church, which I don't know if I, I agree with, but yeah, yeah, higher power, no question. Can you define how they identify with it? With you? They, they see it kind of, they, they tailor their scriptures to the, to the model. So they look at their scriptures and then they say, I mean, Christianity was the first one to jump on this. And they, and they said, okay, they, they analyzed, like, for example, we'll just use Christianity. They looked at it and said, okay, uh, do, does, you know, does chapter and verse kind of follow along with this? And they went through it with a fine tooth comb. And yeah, the King James Bible turns out uh, they, a lot of people say, oh yeah, it's, it's a flat earth book. And since Christianity and Judaism and, um, uh, Islam shares some of the same stories. It was not. It wasn't. wasn't hard for those three to get on board. The other two look at it as sort of a, a an interesting possibility, but they you know none of them are shooting it down, which I think is fascinating. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Is there like a right, line of people over there that I can't see? <laughs> Uh, yeah. we got two here and then you've been very, very generous. Oh, no, no, I don't mind. I don't mind. Wait, we got. Hey, Mark. Uh, my name is TJ. Hi. And I will try to be brief, sure. but I'll probably end up talking a lot longer. That's fine. I'm going to I'm doing so. But uh, yeah, my first question, I have a couple questions, is uh, would you be able to speak of maybe the government officials or any top tier or high merit? status people that would defend the flat earth theory maybe in like a whistleblowing per se matter there okay that's that's good first off 90 percent of our community is still in the closet uh and by that i mean i get emails from them and phone calls from them every hour of every day um and what so if half half the half of the can I say gay community? I'm just going to say it. If half the gay community is in the closet, then 90% of, of the flatters community is in the closet. Are there high ranking members that I have spoken to high profile people that are into this? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. You bet. Most of them aren't going to come out until there's more people on the dance floor. Uh, I have talked to a listers and it's, it's really, really surprising, but most of them figured out that it was a little dangerous after that whole Kyrie Irving thing. If you remember, you know, Kyrie Irving, the, the basketball player for the United States, uh, came came out, you know, LeBron James, best friend at the time and won his championship. He was 25, got nothing to lose. I'm going to come out about Flat Earth. Yeah, that worked out really well for him because the journalists just. I feel like sports 
you know, a sports figure is kind of different. Than oh, I know, that. I know. But but having him, the point was, is he was a high ranking, a public personality in the in the athletic world. And once everybody else saw that, they're like, oh, okay. And that's why Shaquille O'Neal, for example, backed down in ten days. You know, he was totally with us. And then it was like, well, you know, he makes twenty million a year in sponsorships. Didn't take much for his agent to to do that. Um, other people. You know, but, well, here, per, perfect example. Like I've got a, a playlist on my, my YouTube channel called Subject Matter Experts, where you have all branches of the armed forces. You have flight controllers and pilots and engineers and, and air traffic controllers and the whole tons of people. Those guys are willing to come out because why not? But the high, high profile people, they're few and far between because they're, they're worried about the media. Social media has the flip side to it, which is it microscopes everything. And they, you know, they're, they're nervous about it. So I don't mind. I don't blame them, but they're still out there. You know, I, I chat with them on a regular basis and it's like, oh yeah, waiting, waiting for that day. And my last question yeah. is, uh, you talked about how the edge in our, in, uh, in Antarctica was maybe a thousand feet or a thousand miles deep. Oh, I'll probably, probably way thicker than that, but go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering what about the other edges? Like, could we not go to Antarctica and maybe try to find a different... Well, spot? that's just it. The Antarctic <laughs> Treaty is pretty bulletproof. You can look it up if anyone wants a copy. I mean, you can find the PDF online. It's, it's pretty easy. Oh, so they, they've actually gone close enough to touch the edge. Well... No, I mean, again, you can, you, if you guys want to go, it's a little pricey. If you guys want to go in Antarctica right now, you could go. It costs about. Uh, is that the only spot, I guess? That's, that's kind of what I was wondering. Is Antarctica the only spot that you could go to? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there's something weird happening at the North Pole, I guess, but it's so small that, again, who goes to the North Pole? I mean, most people don't even go to the North Pole, let alone the, uh, the, the, the outer rim. So, yeah, that Antarctica is the only place you can go. That, which is why it's sealed off. I mean, that's so just north and south, not east or. Oh yeah. Right? By the way, yeah. If, on on a, on a flat Earth map, what is north, south, east, west? The only thing you've got is the center, and then north, south, east, west is kind of. And that comes. Yeah. Outside, right? Yeah. And then Antarctica would be one of the. And, well, Antarctica is every all point. If if the North Pole is the center, then Antarctica is the entire outer side. So, oh, okay. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Thank you for your yeah, yeah. answer. Uh, we, got a, we got a last one. Dun, dun, dun. Last. Boy, it better be good. Pressure's on you. <laughs> Hi, Bella. Thanks for um, talking to us today. Yeah. Um, I have one question that goes off of what she was saying earlier about like the morality side sure. of it. And then it will just like about the geology. So, you were explaining that if the flat earth is real, then there's something that created it yeah. and you were saying it's either divine power or some super civilization that's way older and smarter and like yeah. advanced that just created us yeah. but the way you were describing it is like it seems to me that you would personally believe that it's a divine power because if it was created you were saying that it would be created like for us which would give us some sense of like purpose right. but if it was a super civilization why would they create anything for us? Wouldn't we be created for them, giving us a much lesser sense of purpose? Mm, very good. Very good. You see through it, don't you? This is a smart one. Keep, keep an eye on her. I'd be really suspicious of her. The, uh, no, what the question is, is good, which is, is whoever built this, why would they build it? Why, why build a place like this? Who doesn't it benefit? You wouldn't build it unless it was going to benefit you in, in some way, shape or form. Maybe some sort of like experiment. Yeah. Out. I mean, you could, th this place can only be one of three things for us anyway. It's either um, a form of entertainment, a form of confinement or some sort of education system. Well, if it's an entertainment thing, there's not a lot of people not having so much fun. I, I don't think it's entertainment solely. Um, if it's confinement, well, it's an awfully nice prison. I mean, honestly, if you take the humans out of the equation, it's a very beautiful place. Um, it feels more like a school than anything else. It feels like we're here to learn something. Now, from the outside, I'm a big believer, and I think I talked about this in the book. Uh, I'm a big believer that the, the universe as a whole, it, regardless of what civilization you're in, runs on novelty. Meaning, you know, every, everything, when, when everyone's talking to each other, it's like, hey, what's up? What's new? What's new? You know, everyone's looking for what's new. Everyone, no one likes being bored. And I think this is one of those places. I think that 
I don't want to get into it too much, but I think that that this is one of those places that can create novelty for someone that was outside. I mean, come on, we're pretty interesting. I mean, the outside looking in, you're like, oh my god, what are they going to do now? As far as <laughs> what does that factor give you a sense of purpose personally, knowing that we're like either either created by divine power. That's one side. Yeah. I'm not really touching yeah, yeah. that one, but I'm talking about the like simulation side more than anything. Yeah. Wouldn't that just make us test subjects with like really like it would make us kind of like intangible at an extent other than like yeah but again with with love <laughs> I'm trying to say I'm trying to make this spin this end this with a on a on a good note are we are we a box of kit are, are we a box of kittens that should be nurtured and protected from what's ever outside of this place or are we a box of scorpions that should never ever be let out ever. I think we're a little bit of both. Yeah, I mean, but at the same time, whoever is whoever's outside of this place, they built it with a lot of care and precision and cleverness to where, I mean, regardless what their, I mean, you can't really expect me. It's like, what's the motivation of God? It's like, really? <laughs> I'd, it'd be, that'd be a tough call for anybody. Um, do do I think that it was, that it was built with I think it was built with more than just an experiment in place. Who knows? Maybe it is, you know, just just an experiment, and we, and and we're part of the test test group. Don't know. Uh, have to ask them. Um, also, I was just curious if the sun is in the dome, yeah. what is protecting us from the sun aside from distance? If there's no like ozone in your oh like, oh protect- oh, like what's what's keeping the sun from burning us alive? Type thing. Yeah. Don't know, because when I, I know I'm a little older, some years ago when we were using styrofoam and everyone was using uh, spray on deodorants, you know, they, they, they kept showing us these weird graphics about how the ozone was this big hole down in Antarctica, which made even Antarctica even scarier. So I don't know. I mean, I don't I, at this point, I had to reevaluate what the sun was entirely, meaning is the sun giving off? so many so many rays that that we need that particular layer or is the ozone layer not exactly what was described to us i i don't know i mean there's there's more to there's more we have to learn about what's up there than and we have to basically tear it down and rebuild it all right uh mark we really appreciate uh very very much speaking to us uh honestly do you have any uh final comments or do you want yeah 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 yeah. real quick which is look look take take what i say uh with a grain of salt i mean don't don't believe you know what i'm saying here is as as gospel you know do your own research and ask questions i'm not here to convince you i'm not here to persuade you i'm just here to put a couple ideas in your head and say you know what this might be possible might want to take a look it's your choice. You either do or don't. But as I said in the first chapter of the book, if you like your life the way it is, you wake up every morning, you say thumbs up, everything is awesome. Don't do it. Don't do it because it is a rabbit hole that few can escape. If you go down it, you're not coming back out. It is no different than the matrix, which is once once you're in, you're in. We have a 99% retention rate. I never expected that. So, but again, to, to, last last thing, which is when you're looking at news stories that's out there, look at it with a slightly skeptical eye. Don't take what every anyone says at, you know, at, at face value. There's an old, old saying, I'll end it with this, is um, trust everyone, but count your change. How's that? Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. I'll see you.